Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Yes, We're Here, and we certainly are. And this is a throwback edition. Uh, this man, everybody knows. I worked with him for 10 years, 10 great years, four championship years, and he is my good, good friend, John Sterling. John, how you doing, buddy? Well, like everyone else, you know, I'm, as they say, under house arrest. And, uh, you know, I'm just hoping and praying that people will follow these safety guidelines. Everyone stay in and, um, and we're going to be able to lick this thing. It may take a while, but this is a problem. Well, obviously, I mean, I'm just saying what everyone else has said. This is a problem for the world. It isn't just the United States. So obviously, as a world, we have to come together and, and lick this thing. Anyway, it's good being on the air with you again. Yes, it is. It absolutely is. And I was wondering, you know, so many people uh, don't like being cooped up and staying in the house and it just feels suffocating. I, I thought about you a lot because it could go either two ways with you. You're either very social, you like to go to dinner with people, but I also know, John, that you love alone time. So has this been as difficult as it is for you and for you know, other people as it is for you? Well, you'd like to have a normal life. I mean, there's no question about that. One of the tough things, I said, someone did an article on me, and I, I said, you can't call up your friends and meet for dinner somewhere. There's no place that's open. Um, but I have a, a very lovely apartment looking over the Hudson. It's a big apartment. And, uh, you know, my kids will come down and, and bring me things. And, uh, and I read in the afternoon. Every afternoon, I, I'm in, in the middle of a book. Anyway, I'm doing okay. Um, I'm very lucky that I haven't got the virus. I'm happy that you haven't gotten it. Susan hasn't gotten it. Now, I call friends every day around the country to see how they're doing. And, um, you know, for them, so far, so good. I was uh, going through the Internet the other day, because that's what you do when you have 24 hours to, uh, to actually find something to do. And I came across um, a piece of uh, video from that famous game in Atlanta where Rick Camp hit the home run. I'm oh, sure right. Oh. And the, the, the thing that amazed me, and I was going to call you up, but I knew that we were going to go on the air today, so I wanted to tell you on the air. You know, that was about 35 years ago, something like that. And yes. you, <laughs> you had the call for the Camp home run. And, John, I'm telling you, you don't sound any different today than you did 35 years ago. Your voice is exactly the same. Well, um, first of all, I thank you for that. And um, I've been very fortunate. Look, I've been very fortunate in a lot of ways. And um, that's one of them that my voice sounds, you know, basically when I did these shows with Susan um, before we played back old Yankee games this week from 2009. And um, you remember this, Michael. Uh, A-Rod had a home run on the first pitch he saw of the season, a three-run home run of Guthrie in Baltimore. We played that home run, and the day before we played a Swisher walk-off in the ninth inning home run. And, you know, it, it sounded like the old days, so I'm very fortunate. How are you I, doing? Are you doing your show from home? Doing the show from home, uh, both on TV and, and radio, out of my home office. And uh, everything is uh, everything's working as well as can be expected. Don and Peter in their homes, and we just talk for four hours, which takes your minds off the thing, Sean. Oh, yeah. No, I think it's a very good thing. No, I like being on the – on the air, on this phone. Uh, how are your kids doing? Now, you have little kids. You have to entertain them. And so how are they doing? Well, the entertaining part is, uh, you know, it's difficult because, you know, they miss their friends and they want to see their friends, but they, they kind of understand what's going on. Uh, the heavy lifting is being done by Jody because she's teaching them a full curriculum. So the school is sending stuff on computers and she sits down and teaches Callie and Charlie and it's hard to keep them, you know, next to each other and not distracting each other. So that's been the heavy lifting uh, for the four of us. But uh, we're getting through, and the kids seem to have adapted. And we're lucky we have a backyard so they can actually get out and run a little bit and not have to come into contact with other people. But it's, uh, it's a very odd time, John, very odd time. Well, it's certainly, uh, Michael, I mean, I don't take any genius to say this. This is the oddest time of our lives. And um, I'm older than you are, so I even have more years to look at it. It's absolutely amazing. The only thing that may, may have come close was how we all shut everything down after 9-11. But that was just a week, and then the Yankees played in Chicago, I think was our first game. Yep. And um, 
uh, you know, I remember that one wonderful thing about that game. The Yankees won the game, but it didn't really matter. But some fans in Chicago held up a sign, we love New York, <laughs> which, you know, normally you don't get. But we got that because of uh, 9-11. Anyway, listen, uh, this is a virus that attacks everyone. It doesn't matter anything about the person, whether they're male, female, black, white, uh, what country you're from, what religion, what it means nothing. And um, so we have to, you know, really band together. You read all these things that are going on from people who can afford it, who are donating. Uh, Drew Brees donated five million dollars. Wow. Yeah. In uh, in New Orleans. Anyway, that's kind of a good thing. I think hopefully it's going to bring us and the world together a little bit because we're all in the same boat. We're all we're all fighting this thing. Um, you know, you mentioned that we did 10 years together and uh, it was it was just fabulous. And in the middle of that, of course, we had the the run first with Buck in 95. And after losing that playoff, it was a really tough loss. Uh, then Joe Torre came in and all the phenomenal success. Um, does anything stand out in your mind, uh, any game or group of games in the 10 years? I have one in my mind. So what what is in your mind? The one that I always talk about because it was new. I mean, there were championships and things like that, which were thrilling. And, you know, we never knew if we were going to uh, experience that uh, behind the mic with the Yankees. And then we got four. But I'll always remember game one at the stadium. 1995 because it was all new right. and when Mattingly came out to, to, to run sprints in the outfield and the entire crowd went nuts and uh, when Buck got introduced by Bob Shepard before they introduced the starting lineup and you know he was never a guy to show that much emotion he came out of the dugout pumping his fist I, I get goosebumps thinking about that and how loud that ballpark was because again the fans weren't spoiled yet it had been a long time it had been a long grind to get there I'll always remember that entire five game set, John. Those that's what stands out to me. How about you? Well, it was a it was a phenomenal series, um, and as I've said about a billion times, it, it was the the highest of highs. Those two wins at home, the last game in the freezing rain in the fifteenth inning or so, and the long flight to Seattle, and then the three terrible losses. <laughs> And the Yankees even held the lead going in the eighth inning of the fifth and final game, and then in the top of the tenth or top of eleventh. So I can understand that's that's in my memory too. I'll always remember Michael the three games in Atlanta the next year in '96. Yeah. Each one was vital. Uh, one and one the middle game. The Yankees are down six nothing in the sixth inning and win. <laughs> we just. Phenomenal, and then Pettit won one nothing, And our booth, we had the crummiest booth because we were visiting radio. It was such a crummy booth last year of Atlanta Fulton County Stadium that the L.A. riders used to call Atlanta Filthy County Stadium. <laughs> and, uh, and it was so bad that we moved to the back row instead of being in the front row. It just didn't work. And so we filled up the booth with uh, uh, Jennifer and uh, – and our good friend Lisa and the Hershons. And we had a whole booth full of people. And the three games were, uh, those are three of the most phenomenal games I've ever seen. So those, those are great memories, aren't they? You know, it's amazing, John, because if you think about the 10 years we spent together, uh, it was the beginning of the Buck era. Uh, so they, they progressively got better in 94. And it's amazing to have a run like that and to have to choose great moments. I mean, 98, that, that 125 and 50 team. 99 when they sweep the Braves. 2000, the Subway Series, the first one since 1956. And, and although they ended up losing, John, 2001 was an absolutely thrilling World Series where there are like three or four forever games in there. So, I mean, we were very fortunate. We, uh, you once told me when I first started with you, you really, should, you really should look for the Yankees and want them to win. And I said, why? Because I was still a, a writer at heart. And you said, because if you bring people good news, they're going to end up liking you and remember you. And <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it always helps to give the good news. And also, if you're a broadcaster, you have nothing to do with it. It's how they play. And so we were very fortunate. And first of all, it began in '94. They they should have won the AL 
East, and maybe they would have gone to the World Series that year. Uh, they had a six and a half game lead. Anyway, that's we, we had some games, two years in a row of of perfect games, and um, you know I always remember your calls in the seventh inning of Game One against the Padres, and the Yankees are down by five runs in the seventh. Knobloch hits a two-run home run, and then Tino hits a grand slam. And um, I don't know if I ever told you this, Michael, but in L.A., um, the uh, the color man on radio is the left-handed Mark Langston, um, who was pitching to Tino. He came in relief as a lefty, and he thought he had him struck out. And then on the next pitch, Tino hit the grand slam. And uh, really, as close as last year or the year before, Mark Langston, you know, leaned over and said to me, Come on, that was a strike, right? <laughs> it, was, it was 95. This is more than 20 years later, and he's still looking at it. Yeah, that was a strike. Come on, John. That was a <laughs> Let's so, say it was anyway. for Tino. It was pretty close, John. Oh, yeah, it sure was. It sure was. I, I think the home plate umpire, and I forget who he was, said that the catcher moved his glove a little at the end. And I think that's why I called it a ball. Anyway, it worked you know, out. And you, you think about the butterfly effect, and, and you know people remember Tino very fondly, which they should. But before that hit, John, in the postseason for the Yankees, he did not do well at all. He uh, he was not coming up big in big spots in '96 and '97. But that that kind of freed him up a little bit, if you remember. That kind of let him exhale, and all of a sudden he became a much better hitter in the postseason. I know that meant a lot to him. So that was a big home run, and that was a big two-two call. I'll tell you that. Um, it, was, start, it was a big call. I agree. We start. You know, I, I asked you about the Rick Camp thing, and when you know, I listened to your call. It's a phenomenal call, but you didn't say it's high, it's far, it's gone. When did that start? Uh, in a game um, later in the eighties, uh, Doc Gooden was pitching for the Mets. Dale Murphy was up for the Braves. I was on TV. And um, Gooden threw a breaking ball, but it was a bad breaking ball. You could see it, a hanger. And so um, I think I said breaking ball, swung on it, hit in the air to deep left. Well, now, Atlanta Fulton County Stadium was a double – it's really a football stadium – was double-tiered all the way around. So it framed home runs great. And the minute Murphy hit it, you knew it was out, and something happened in my – my crazy little mind, and I said, it is high, it is far, it is gone. The camp home run, how could you call that? <laughs> I thought it was a bad call, by the way, but, I mean, how would you ever think the worst hitter in baseball history <laughs> would hit a three-run home run in the 18th inning to retie the game that the Braves tied up about five times? Terry Harper had hit a three-run home run in the 13th inning off the foul screen down the left field line, so that was a crazy game. And I, you know what I remember about that game, John? It shows you how our lives were so different at that point. So you're in Atlanta calling that game, and I'm in a bar in, in Hampton Bays. Uh, <laughs> had it on TV. I'm up at about 3.30, 3.45 in the morning. And I'm just looking up there, you know, as it, you know, everybody's partying and whatever. And little did I know that the guy who was calling Rick Camp's home run would be such a big part of my life. Yeah, it's amazing how things work out. and. Um, let's face it, Michael, um, the people miss a lot of things. There are a lot of things. And the fact that people are dying is just horrendous, but people really miss sports. <laughs> there, oh, yeah. there are no games on, you read the newspaper and, um, it just feature stories. And if you put on TV to the, to the team channels, they're showing old games and, um, I don't know when this is going to begin. When do you think it'll begin? They could have a season if they play July, August, September, and October, and then play the the playoffs and World Series in retractable domes or warm weather sites. You know, for one year you can do that. And I think when they come back, they ought to play a doubleheader every week. But and any of your thoughts when you look ahead, would it be by July? Well, I mean, Dr. Fauci probably said it best. He said, we can't make plans. The virus will dictate what we do. But I, I would say, in my eyes, John, the best case scenario is probably in July. And I, I believe at that time, we will not be playing in front of fans for a while. Uh, I just don't think that's going to happen until there's immediate testing where 
you know that if you come into a ballpark, the person sitting next to you is not either carrying or has the virus. So I think it's a very complicated road ahead of us. But if it happens by July, I think I'd, I'd be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I think if it happened by July, they could get in, you know, what, what's the season? They, I guess they could get in 120 games with a doubleheader every week. Every team should have to play a straight doubleheader. And um, as we try to get life back to normal, I agree with you. I think when they, they begin, um, there'll be empty ballparks, which will be weird. Be great for ratings, though. <laughs> but oh, <laughs> it, it'll, be, it'll be weird. You know, our good friend uh, David Cohn probably said it best. I, I had Mariano Rivera on my radio show, and Mariano Rivera said, it can't be a season of 60 games because that's not the test of a true champion. And then I asked David that. And you know what David said, John? He said, if it's 40 games, you've got to play it just for the country, just for the diversion. He said, I don't care if it's a legitimate champion or not. If you can only get in 40 games and it's okay to play in August, then that's what you do. And I, you know what? I've come around to his way of thinking. I think it's very important for the country to have this diversion. And if they could play 40 games, then they play 40 games. Well, I, I also would agree with, uh, with David. I think it's very important that eventually – that they start to play and manufacture some kind of a season. And they have played fewer than the allotted number of games in 95 when the season began late, thanks to Judge Sotomayor. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. Hey, I'm all for anything getting out of the house. So, I mean, yeah. But I, I'm all for that. And I, and I do think, uh, the way most people, that uh, you can't make a decision of when you're going to start because the virus tells you that. And we have to get a handle on the virus, obviously. And, you know, um, our, our friends at Yes, you know, they asked me, do you think that you and John could fill 10 minutes? I said, 10 minutes? <laughs> there are throats. <laughs> You're going to have to cut this down, John. It's been great being on the air with you again. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I'll, I, I, I hope we'll do it again. You know how I feel about you. I want you to stay safe. I love you. And uh, can't wait to see you at the ballpark real soon. Well, and to you, Michael, your family, and to uh, to everyone listening, I said it on the air the other night, we, we need you. We love you. Please stay safe. Obey all the, the safety regulations. Stay safe. And, and Michael, any time that, um, that uh, Yes wants us to get together to do this again, I'll be, I'll be here waiting in my living room. I promise. <laughs> Sounds good. And to everybody out there, you stay safe. Wash your hands. Six feet distance. You know all the rules. For John Sterling, I'm Michael K. It's been fun. Yes, we're here.